In multiply symbolization, we added the ability to symbolize using operations and identity. Now operations aren't anything too complicated, they just pick out individual terms. And as such, operations fit seamlessly into our derivation system now. You just have to remember that you can UI to them and you can EG from them, but this is really best demonstrated in the example videos that I've provided elsewhere. Identity does come with its own set of rules, and in fact we would need to add rules to our system to be able to do derivations with identity as a predicate. We're not going to learn those rules, but uh, it wouldn't be too difficult for us to add identity in the future to our system. So what do you need to know about derivations in multiplace predicate logic? Well, you just need to know that everything you already learned about derivations holds here, and that will allow you to solve every single question. In this video, I'm just going to tie up some loose ends and introduce one more derived rule that will help when you look at certain questions from other texts, and will sort of just clear up a bit of lingering confusion on some of the ways that we introduce certain things. Let's take a look at this sentence. There exists an x, fx, and for all x, gx, arrow, hx. Is it ambiguous? In the past, I actually sort of suggested that it is ambiguous, and the reason why is because, well, I use the same variable letter within the scope. And so here, for g and h, the question is that x there, is that part of the existential x, or is that part of the universal x? And it seems unclear. Now it actually turns out that there is a convention that logicians sometimes use, uh, which is that in cases of scope conflict like this, it's actually always the immediate scope that wins. It's the immediate scope that takes precedent. So in this case, it's actually the uh, x uh, is associated with the universal x and not the existential x. Now you could say this is a bit silly, uh, why don't I just change this to say there exists a y, fy, or I could change maybe the latter x's to y's, for example. And what this is sort of saying is that, look, the choice of letter is sort of arbitrary. It doesn't matter at all. So why would I ever write the first sentence when I can write the second? Well, there's no real reason behind this. Some people just do write it this way and some people don't. But we just need to know the convention so we can decipher it. Now there is a formal rule that sort of demonstrates how we can actually change the variable letter so that we don't have to ha look at ugly sentences like that. And that rule is alphabetic variance. Alphabetic variance is sort of like a schematic rule. It says if I have a quantifier uh, where my variable say alpha over the scope of a sentence, I can change all the instances of alpha and change the alpha bound to the quantifier to some new variable. So it basically just means I can change, like in that previous example, all the x's to y's, and as long as I don't actually change and capture too much information, I'm fine. And that's what the restriction is saying. You just can't do anything that would dramatically change the relationships in the sentence. All we're doing is a purely cosmetic change with alphabetic variance. Alphabetic variance is an interesting rule because it makes clear that a bound variable is actually meaningless in terms of what letter it actually is. So if you have a for all x, it doesn't matter. What AV tells us is that we can change it to y, z, i. It doesn't matter anything at all, and it doesn't make a difference because as long as it's bound, it's not really impacting our derivation in any way at all. Uh, so in terms of its application, one application is to clear up those sentences that we just looked at where by convention we understand that it's not ambiguous but we can make it explicit with alphabetic variance. Now another way that alphabetic variance is actually sort of useful is in really understanding uh, things about universal derivations and the restrictions that go on with UD. Here's the universal derivation rule that we learned. Now what's odd about the universal derivation rule is it's got these complicated restrictions. So let's focus on the first restriction. Alpha cannot appear unbound in any previous available line. So what this is saying is for us to do universal derivation, the letter that we do the UD to has to be perfectly arbitrary. And that makes sense. We understood that that is actually the key feature of a universal derivation. It's the arbitrariness of alpha. But in practice, sometimes this actually leads to some annoying things. Because if I try and do a universal derivation like this, but alpha actually does appear unbound in a previous line, I won't actually be allowed to or able to close my universal derivation. And this is sort of an annoying issue when I want to do a UD. Now, the way around this could be, actually, why don't I do a show of an instantiation instead of to alpha, but to beta? And in this way, maybe beta, this different variable, would be free and I preserve the arbitrariness of my universal derivation. Now in principle, there's actually nothing wrong with this reasoning, but 
in certain texts, and in particularly those texts that come from Kalish, Montague, and Marr, like the Parsons uh, system, including Logic 2010, do not allow this move. To do universal derivation, if I want to show for all alpha something, I have to instantiate to alpha. I can't choose a different letter. That actually violates the system. Now, I don't fully agree with this, but this is just a convention adopted by a lot of the texts out there, so we're just going to stick with it. And if you actually try and do it this way, it won't let you. The system will say the variables don't match up. You can't perform a universal derivation like this. So what are you supposed to do in situations where you want to do a UD, but the variable is actually already free? Well, alphabetic variance teaches us that the bound variable actually doesn't matter what it is. So we can use AV in a clever way to get around this problem. If I want for all alpha, phi alpha, what I can really do is, assuming alpha is unavailable for a universal derivation, show the analogous statement for all beta, phi beta. So I've basically shown something else that actually has an entirely different letter, and the point is this letter is nice and arbitrary. And so the system will allow me to do a universal derivation. But once I have this, I can just use alphabetic variance on it to change the beta back into the original letter that I want. Lots of people think this is a very powerful rule, but it's actually not that powerful. Alphabetic variance is a derived rule in our system, so we can't treat it as one of our basic rules. So instead of doing this entire thing, what I could have actually done is I could have just used quantifier negation and I would have been able to do the exact same derivation with an assume ID. So even though AV seems nice in this situation, you can do without it at all times just by using assume ID, quantifier negate, and you'll be able to answer your derivation and get around these universal derivation problems in general. So the second restriction to universal derivation is a bit odd. It says that alpha also cannot appear unbound in a premise used in an available line. Now this is so weird. Why does it stipulate that the premise have to be used in an available line? Why can't it just be unused or unbound in any previous premise at all? And this is a weird, annoying aspect of logic where logicians have sort of taken a cue from mathematicians. Let's take a look at this example fx arrow gx fa therefore ga and if you recognize this this is sort of the evil cat example now when i actually want to do this derivation i run into a problem i want to show ga but then what can i do in fact nothing actually lines up i can't use premise one with premise two because one is in terms of x and the other in turn terms of a so this derivation just won't work well, the reason why is because fx arrow gx just is sort of weird. It's just this unbound free variable premise. But the convention turns out to be that if you have free variables in a premise, it's actually a hidden code that they should be universally quantified. It's actually like I was just too lazy to write for all x fx arrow gx, and I just left it as fx arrow gx. So why does this happen? Well, I'm not so sure. It happens because mathematicians are like this, and I guess logicians sort of just want to sort of legitimize what mathematicians do, and so that's okay, it's no big deal. So what we have to do instead is we actually have to turn that premise into a universal. And the way we do it is we just run a clean universal derivation on the premise. I actually want to show for all x fx arrow gx, and the way I show that is I show the instantiation fx arrow gx, I just repeat premise one, oh say direct derivation, no problem. And now I close with the universal derivation. But wait, you might say, I can't close with the universal derivation because x appeared free in my premise. And that's why the universal derivation restriction says that free variables and a premise do not affect UD so that we can do this. They only affect it if we somehow use the premise in a subsequent line. So if you ever see a derivation where they're loaded up with all sorts of examples of these premises, uh, like fx arrow gx without universal quantification, the first thing you want to do is you want to do something like this. You want to actually prove the universal quantification of all these premises, and you can use alphabetic variance if you want on this uh, to change the letters around. And then once you have actually proved that, then you continue on and finish your proof as normal. You may have noticed that I've actually sort of contradicted myself in a weird way when it comes to the concept of an arbitrary variable. Arbitrary variables are of critical importance to universal derivation and existential instantiation, but we have different requirements for each of them, as you can see here. 
the restriction for an arbitrary variable for existential instantiation is way stronger, much, much stronger than that for universal derivation. In fact, it says it can't appear in any previous align or premise at all. Even if it's bound, you can't actually EI to it. And UD is much weaker and has these sort of odd restrictions to it that we just sort of explained in the previous section. So what is the right definition of arbitrary variable? Well, technically speaking, uh, an arbitrary variable is just something we don't know anything about. So in fact, both the UD and the EI restrictions are actually a little even too strong for just the basic understanding of arbitrariness. Now, why is it then that EI uses a much stronger restriction of arbitrary than UD? This actually is purely convention based on logic textbooks. Some logic textbooks have different restrictions than others on what you can EI to or what you can UD to. And these seem to be actually be perfectly arbitrary in and of themselves. Uh, I think they're really put in place for pedagogical reasons. Existential instantiation is sort of messed up so often that I think writers of textbooks have just placed this super strong blanket restriction on what counts as arbitrary so that there's no risk of getting confused. Uh, but arguably, this sort of breaks down because then we end up being confused about what it means to be arbitrary in general because it can contradicts with, say, what I. Uh, an arbitrary variable is for UD. Moral of the story, you don't need to worry about it. Just know that these extra restrictions that we place are actually sort of on top for non-logical reasons. They're for practical or pedagogical reasons only. So that's it for the loose ends of multi-place predicate logic. I really sort of just tried to uh, cast a bit of light on some of the odd areas of our system. And nothing taught here is really necessary or critical in terms of solving derivations. You will find that some of these skills and knowledge do open up potential derivations for you to solve that you looked at sort of quizzically in the past. Uh, but these are typically questions from other texts, which I don't actually assign. So hopefully this will open things up for you, and you should be able to do more practice problems.